Right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, Alhamdulillah, we have reached day seven of uh, Ramadan al Kareem uh, in our view of uh, selected portions of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, um, well, we're trying to pick up some pace, but inshallah, inshallah, with Allah's help, let's see, because the idea was that we will try our level best to complete up till uh, uh, Surah al kahf right? But as you can see, right, the verses are such gems and such glittering stars that how do you just go over them? So, yeah, I need to dis discipline myself, yeah, inshallah, and uh, try to kind of catch some kind of a speed, right? So, yesterday, we uh, stopped at ayah number 208, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, <coughs> right, enter into Islam completely, and inshallah, we will just begin from there, a little quick recap, and then we will continue, right? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Al Shalatu was Salamu Allah Sayyidil Ambiya Iwal Mursaleen Sayyidina Wahhabibina was Shafi'ina Muhammad Wa ala Alihi was Shahbihi Ajma'in Rabbi Yastir Walla to Asir Yakarim Waftah Bil Haki in Nakal Fatta Hul Alim Rabbi Shrahi Swadri Wayastirli Amri Wahlul Ukdata Min Nisani Yafkahu Pauli, Amin Yorbal Alameen, Yagapuru Rahim, Yarham Rahimin, Yazal Jalali Walikram, Aubu Billahi Bin Shaytani Rajim, Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim. So Suratul Bakra, ayat number 208, yesterday, which we reviewed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying, was saying, O uh, you who believe, Ya Ayyuhaladina Amanu, Uthulu Fistil Nikafa. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ So in case we get depressed, and yes, obviously when we review ourselves, when we do mahasaba of our own selves, we do realize that perhaps my entire life is actually not within the uh, uh, parameters of the sharia, so to speak. My entire life is not submit, uh, in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but our deen is a deen of hope. Our deen is a deen of, okay, so whatever has happened, fad that has happened. Now move on. Now move on. And, uh, you know, it's cliche, but it is absolutely true that journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make these nights, these days, this Ramadan, that impetus, that first step perhaps, right? Or whichever step set we feel that we are at, make this is the time for us to catapult ourselves forward and enter into the submission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in 208 that, uh, and if you split, even after clear signs have come to you, then you must know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mighty and wise. Then Allah says, they are looking for nothing to accept the truth, but that Allah himself comes upon them in canopies of clouds with angels, and the matter is closed. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all matters will be returned, right? So in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, what are you waiting for? Do you want to see, just like, you know, the Bani Israel used to say, remember, we did the verses earlier that show us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, uh, the mushrikeen of Makkah used to do the same thing with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Put a ladder up to the skies so that we can see him. What are we waiting for? The time when we are actually going to see angels with our own eyes will be the time of our death. Right? Will be the time of our death. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so much and so expansive that the doors of tawbah, the doors of returning to him, the doors of turning towards him are open till the physical process of death actually gets started. So we have got Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that chance, to give, give us that tawfiq, that we do not die till he is pleased with us, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, 
ask the children of Israel how many a clear sign we have given to them and whoever changes the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after it has come to him then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shadid ul iqab that he is severe in punishment you must see here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly talking about his mercy and also constantly talking about his uh, accountability hmm? because we should not have a lopsided picture of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is lest we think and get deluded by the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just merciful and just uh, uh, Rahman and Rahim and he's never going to take us into account because of his uh, mercy. Although Alhamdulillah, uh, that is the greatest mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has actually said that my mercy overcomes my ghadab. Yeah, my mercy overcomes my ghadab. So may we be people who make ourselves eligible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Then Allah says, this is a, this is a scary ayah actually. This is a scary ayah. Yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Zuyyina lilladheena kafaru al- Zuyyina lilladheena kafaru al-hayatul dunya wa yaskharuna min alladheena amanu wal-ladheena attaqaw wal-ladheena attaqaw fawqahum yawm al-qiyamah wallahu yarzuqu man yasha bi ghayri hisab adorned is this dunya adorned is this hayat ad dunya for those who disbelieve allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying for those who disbelieve who have this who don't have this true iman in their hearts this hayat ad dunya this life of this world is adorned for them and they are the ones who make fun of the disbelievers they mock them they jest at them and uh, allah is making this strong statement that it is the believers right minal ladina wal ladina taqaw fawqahum yawm al qiyamah it is the ones who have this taqwa of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are going to be uh, at the upper end who are going to be above those who have been making fun of them who have been mocking them in this dunya hmm? and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to whom he wills without measure so what is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually saying over here <clears throat> allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about the reality of this hayat ad dunya in many many places in the quran right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to give us the true picture of what this dunya and all that is in it is say for example inshallah we'll come to this when we come to surah nisa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says qul o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say mata'u dunya qalil every single thing that exists in this dunya in this world is qalil meaning uh, insignificant small trifle in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also refers to dunya as a place of ghurur mata'ul ghurur ta mata'ul qalil qalil over here but allah says mata'ul ghurur as well what does that mean it is a place of delusion a place of deception a place where human beings are tricked and duped a place where human beings find themselves attracted if you look at this word mata over here right in this aya of surah nisa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about zuyyina lil ladina kafaru al hayat ad dunya that this haya this this worldly life has been adorned for those who have no iman or very little iman who have kufr in their hearts <clears throat> so this word mata actually means uh, one way to understand it is that it is something which is necessary right for 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 this life but it is not kind of be all end all so you can look at the example of a toilet brush i always give this example of a toilet brush everybody has a toilet brush in their homes hopefully yes yeah because we need to have clean toilets it is it is a necessary item that you need to have in your home but do you sit and have a conversation about it oh yours is so pretty oh is it a purple one where did you get it from yeah we generally don't do that we generally don't do that and that is a good thing the minute we start talking about toilet brushes then may allah subhanahu wa taala have mercy on us that that is mata something that you need something that is necessary for this dunya right 
So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this dunya, it is not negating the dunya at all. Because yesterday we, we, we did this dua, which was frequently uh, uh, recited by uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana ta wa qina adhaban So it's not that dunya is a place to hate. It is not that dunya is a place to uh, let go of because we have to traverse this dunya in order to go back to the uh, uh, to our original home. You know? What it means is that the love of dunya, <clears throat> the hub of dunya, the attachment to dunya should not be so much that we completely forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We completely forget about uh, akhirah. We completely forego the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those people who are trying to be ibadullah, abd of Allah, we make fun of them, right? We, we, become, we, be, we mock them, etc. Okay? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Hubbu dunya ra'su kullun khati'ah. What this means is that love of this world is the source of all error. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not saying that love of um, sin, that love of, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, hang on. love of anything forbidden. No, Allah is saying love of this dunya, love of this dunya, even the halal of this dunya. This is not talking about just the haram of this dunya, something which is not love of sharab, love of drugs. No. Love of even the halal of this dunya. What does it mean? Um, this basically means that everywhere you see around us, and more and more and more and more, this glitter and glamour and shimmering, brilliant styles, life and fashion displays of the dunya, they're all around us, right? Now we are living in that age where even if you don't step out of your house, everything is available to you on your fingertip. Via media, right? Via social media. Back in the day, you had to actually go out to the mall. Now the mall is right in your hands. So this is what the whole world of marketing is all about. Trying to make dunya as attractive as possible. It is such a materialistic age. So what happens is that all of this marketing and media takes over our heart. Dunya enters our heart, takes over our passions and the attractions of our hearts instead of us being passionate about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about Quran, about the sunnah of Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And when we get so kind of... Um, brainwashed almost or trained into getting these visual and sensory pleasures, then we lose the ability to get pleasures of the heart from anything else. When we are feasting our eyes on this display day in and day out and day in and day out, then this Quranic vocabulary of sukoon, of rahat, of itminan, we don't even get it. We don't even get what does it mean? It just doesn't penetrate, right? It just doesn't. So please, it's not talking about sin here. And it is important to understand that because a lot of us might think or have this understanding that it is only sin that is forbidden in the deen of Islam. It is not just sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us away. Most certainly, yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us away from sin. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also calling us away from this attachment of the world from the fascination of the world, right? And again, it doesn't mean at all there is no monasticism in the deen of Islam. That is the reason this is such an amazing deen and we have such an amazing example in the life of the Rasulullah, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that people generally, if we think that somebody is very muttaqi, Allah wala, etc., would have nothing to do with this dunya, right? A lot of times we have this problem, huh? Oh, uh, a Malvi sahab in a Mercedes. Now imagine what image that brings to your head. Why shouldn't Malwali Sahib be in a Mercedes? As long as dunya is in your hand and not in your heart, that's not an issue at all. 
always remember rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana right it's the hub of this dunya right which is problematic it's the hub which is problematic and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that it is a source of all evil we will see that we have this love for the world inside of us and it is very difficult to take out right one scholar said that we shouldn't even say attachment we should say that we are enslaved and which is very true we are absolutely enslaved we are unable to delete this dunya all aspects of this dunya from our mind right if i'm not able to press one single delete button it means that i am enslaved to it when you get up in the morning what is the first thing that you do be very honest yeah does your hand go for your phone do you sleep with your phone in close proximity we are enslaved to our devices right we are literally enslaved we can't live without it it seems like you know it's death if i don't check my messages and that's so egoistic as well right that oh let me check my message as if you're so important that the world is going to come to a standstill if you don't check your messages for an hour this is the hub that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is talking about this is the enslavement and attachment that allah subhanahu wa taala is talking about over here that it has been made it has been adorned for uh, for the kafiri for those who have kufr in their heart right and because of that the ones who are trying to be abd of allah subhanahu wa taala they make fun of them they laugh at them they mock them and according to scholars this is the litmus test of true love for allah subhanahu wa taala and for rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam do you have the capacity to be made fun of without falling to pieces without getting into depression without turning back on your deen yeah without making excuses without becoming a sorry muslim all of a sudden no 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 i didn't actually mean it no no right i'm not that rigid no i don't actually i don't belong to a quran class or or or, or anything like that are you can you manage that pressure if you can manage that pressure that allah subhanahu wa taala's basharat allah subhanahu wa taala's glad tidings that uh those who fear allah those who have taqwa of allah right wal ladina taqaw the muttaqin are going to be above them on the day of resurrection and allah subhanahu wa taala gives provision to whomsoever he wills without measure bi ghairi hisab ya rabbi make us from among them ya rabbi make us from among them that you give the provision of taqwa bi ghairi hisab you give the provision of sabr bi ghairi hisab you give the provision of love for you and love for rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam bi ghairi hisab amin ya rabbal alamin then allah subhanahu wa taala is saying in verse number i am number 213 all people used to be a single umma okay. oh sorry before we go on uh, let's just quickly see that what can we do to get this love of dunya out of our hearts that's important right we can't just look at a problem and then not look at a solution so if we see ourselves having this love of dunya if we see ourselves and it is allah subhanahu wa taala has put that attraction in our hearts we will come inshallah to this verse where allah has said that he has put this love of certain things in our hearts yeah he has put that love it is it, it is a test that is this love going to be above the love of allah subhanahu wa taala right so what can we do scholars tell us increasing your taqwa is one way of getting rid of this uh, the, the, this enslavement of this dunya increasing your taqwa increasing your zikr increasing your remembrance of allah subhanahu wa taala there's one hadith where rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said they do zikr of allah so much that people think you are mad yeah sometimes you hear people saying ab allah allah hi karenge baith ke yes absolutely say it with great confidence yes allah allah hi karenge baith and allah allah can be done in the heart 24/7 it is said about imam abu hanifa rahmatullah alayh that once he was walking with his uh, students somewhere and then he stopped and he took out a a, a paper and a, something to write on and he wrote something down and the students asked that oh, what are you doing uh, and he said that i suddenly remembered uh, a some, some task or some chore that he needed to do and he said i wrote it down because it it was interfering with my zikr subhanallah 
my teacher gives an amazing example related to uh, Ramadan particularly, right? In Ramadan, uh, I mean, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't said don't have nice aftar or don't have nice sari. Yeah. Kulu wa shrabu, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said eat and drink in the Quran, my favorite verses. Yeah. So, of course, like have your pakoras, have your samosas, whatever it is that you have. So it was it was really sweet, wonderful the way she explained it. She said that, you know, you hear you you hear verses like this that you know, uh, it's love of dunya is in your heart and you should be Allah focused all of the time. And this is Ramadan, and you say, okay, from now on, I'm just not going to bother about. Let's just have dahi roti or whatever, and I'm not going to bother about star. I'm not going to bother about cooking too much, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Okay, but. You're sitting, say, between Asr and Maghrib, right? Between Asr and Maghrib, Alhamdulillah, we've got more time, right? When we get over the class, there's plenty of time before iftar, right? So you do your Asr and then you have a lot of time to do your Quran and your Zikr, etc. So you're sitting there doing your Zikr or doing Quran and you're only thinking about the some, uh, pakoras. Yeah? You are reading Quran, you are doing Zikr, but your heart is stuck with the pakoras. So she said, wouldn't it be better that you were making the bakoras and your heart is stuck with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Subhanallah, right? To get this love of dunya out of our heart. And the third thing that scholars say is being involved in learning. In being involved in learning of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, inshallah, once we apply all of this and taqwa, remember yesterday we also talked about it, it's something that we do. We increase our zikr, we increase our taqwa, we increase our learning. We are stuck with people who are involved in taqwa and zikr and learning. Then inshallah, inshallah, this love of dunya will get out of our heart. It shouldn't be part of our heart, right? Okay. And um, about zikr, one scholar said that if we had a fault only attitude towards our daily life, towards our dunya, it would mean that we would eat only a few calories per day. If we have a fard only home, we would live a much more simpler life. If we only had a fard only amount of clothing, we would have a much smaller wardrobe. If we have only fard amount of education, we would have so many degrees. We wouldn't have so many degrees that we have. And if we have fard amount of earning, we wouldn't have the jobs that we have. Right? And also another thing before we move on, that love for dunya also includes love for our own self. Right? Love for our own self. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْشَدْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ When you get free, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So instead of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remembering Him, there are people I might be that person, you might be that person, that all we do is think about ourselves. How can I make myself better? What's the next degree that I can get? In, in, for, the, for dunya only, right? Thinking about yourself in relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can I increase my taqwa? That's another thing, right? This is purely devoted to dunya. What is the next contract I can find? Yeah. What's the next door that I can open? What's the next degree that I can get? What's the next TikTok video that I can make to impress people? 15 minutes of fame, hmm? right? What's the next meme that I can come up with? That's all that's going on, right? That is also part of Hubbu Dunya. That is also part of Hubbu Dunya. And a lot of people, young and old, particularly young people these days, but I don't want to be like age biased, right? Perhaps older people as well. All of this, Alhamdulillah, it's wonderful that if you are a YouTube star, it's wonderful that you do something beneficial for people. You can do something very beneficial using media, right? But if that is all that you're doing, that is all that you're thinking about, how can I make my next million, right? <clears throat> then that hope of dunya is there. If all you're thinking about is that, you know, ye hum hai aur ye hamari pari ho hai, then that's problematic. Then that's problematic if that's all you're thinking about, okay? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that, right? So coming to ayah number 213, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all people used to be a single ummah. Then after they differed in matters, matters of faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets carrying good news and warnings and sent down with them the book. Um, 
where is it? Oh, yeah. Uh, send down with them the book with truth to judge between people in matters of their dispute. But it was no other than those to whom it was given, who led by envy against each other, disputed it after the clear signs had come to them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his will guided those who believed to the truth over which they disputed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides whom he wills to the straight path. Right? So what does this mean? Uh, Ummats, remember, we've talked about Ummats so much, people with same aspirations, right, same objectives, following the same path, right? So in matters of uh, uh, Amal, right, uh, there was one Ummah, say, for example, when they began disputing with each other, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Ambiya and sent uh, books of revelation, right? The, the, the objective of sending the Ambiya, sending the Prophet, and the revelations has been to solve differences that arise in an ummah hmm? so that there is unity so that there is haq, right and if they argue or have ikhtilaf against what the prophets bring against what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed right then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he is going to sort that out later on, even after the clear signs have, have come, but those who accept that haq and believe it to be true over what other people are arguing about, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will guide them to the surat al-mustaqeem. Okay. Then in ayah number 214, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, this is talking about trials like we did yesterday. Am hasibtum an tadkhulul jannah? So what is happening over here? Do you think that you will enter Jannah? while you have not yet been visited by difficult circumstances, like those that were faced by the people who passed away before them. Yesterday we talked about it, right? That you think you're going to just, it's going to be like a red carpet thing that, oh, here she comes, let her go. Yeah. They were the people before. They were afflicted by hardship and suffering and were so shaken down that the prophets and those who believed with him started saying, when will the help of Allah come? Then they were comforted by the Prophet who said to them, Behold, have sabr, Nasrullah, Nasrullahi the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is near. Right? We talked about in detail about trials and tribulations, so I'm not going to repeat that. Narrated Khabbab ibn Arat, radiallahu ta'ala an. Khabbab ibn Arat was an amazing sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was also a slave. And he was severely prosecuted in Makkah to the extent that uh, his owner was this wicked, wicked woman, right? Who used to burn him with uh, uh, iron rods, right? In the time of, I think, Omar, right? When uh, the Sahaba, you know, the, the older Sahaba who used to sit and reminisce about all the old time, you know, like when friends get together, they talk about what used to happen. So once Abbad ibn Arat, uh, they were talking about what used to happen in Makkah and all. And somebody asked Abab Ibn Arat about his prosecution. He just lifted up his shirt and showed them their back. And it was full of holes. It was full of holes. And what she used to do was that she would lie him down on burning coals, right? And then he said himself that his, uh, the fat on his back would melt and that would cool the coals. That is the kind of prosecution that the believers had to go through. So who is coming to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The reason I'm telling you this is that it was not just anybody. Habab ibn Arat, who had, who's going through this and who's been through this, comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He says, we complained to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the prosecution, right? While he was sitting in the shade of the Kaaba, leaning over his bar, like a covering sheet. We said to him, would you seek help for us? Would you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, 
among the nations before you. A man would be put in a ditch that was dug for him, and a saw would be put over his head, and he would be cut into two pieces. Yet that torture would not make him give up his beam. His body would be combed with iron combs that would remove his flesh from the bones and nerves, yet that would not make him abandon his deen. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yani, taking an oath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this deen will prevail till a traveler from Sana to Hazar al maut will fear none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a wolf as regards to his sheep. But you people are hasty, right? He's saying this to Khabab ibn Arab radiallahu ta'ala an. Scholars say that sunrise happens after the darkest night, after the darkest night. So even if we go, I mean, please, nowhere near, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from these kind of trials, these kind of trials, because we really don't have the iman to withstand that. Whatever little trial, like yesterday we said, according to our istitaat, according to our uh, uh, ability to bear, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us through. So if somebody is making fun of you because you started covering yourself, for example, that is a very uh, in-your-face thing for women and for girls. Yeah. And unfortunately, that is a thing that we get made fun of a lot. Yeah. Oh, right? Sometimes you will hear, you know, that Urdu Mahavra that you know. So now all, all kinds of things sometimes you get to hear. Have sabr on that. Have sabr on that. Do you think that you're going to enter Jannah? Look at the examples that you have in front of you, right? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all trials and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us solid, absolutely unapologetic Muslims wherever we are, inshallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in ayah number 215, they ask you, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma'adha yunfiqoon uh, what should we spend? Say, O Prophet وسلم, whatever good you spend should be for parents and for Aqrabeen, uh, uh, people who are close to you, your kin's people, orphans, the needy and the wayfarer. And whatever good you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all aware of it. Now, um, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about that the people were asking Rasulullah that um, what should they spend? So in this verse, Allah is saying, who should you spend on? And then inshallah, we'll come to ayah 219, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell us how much to spend, right? So this list, we saw a list in uh, uh, ayat al-bir as well, right? What is this list? Spend on your walidain, top of the list. Khair over here, this word khair is used for wealth in this ayah. Khair is used for wealth. So again, please understand, Wealth is part of this dunya, right? Allah is calling it khayr. Allah is calling it good. So all dunya is not negative. All dunya is not to be shunned, right? You can do a lot of khayr with the dunya that you have, that the dunya that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. So the first khayr to who? In terms of the living people, your walidain. Your walidain. Yeah? Wabil walidaini ahsana. Allah says in so many places, right? And unfortunately, what happens is, that the same walidain, the same parents who have given their sweat and blood for little brats like, you know, whatever, right? When they get old, when they get weak, and their weakness is financial also, their weakness is physical also, right? What happens? We don't really care for them. We don't really spend on them. Right? Spend on them. And spending is Right over here, particularly, it's talking about spending wealth, right? Spending wealth. Last night, I uh, I think somebody had posted this little you know video somewhere. It was it, it was a a story from Italy that this elderly woman who was living alone, she was eighty five or eighty six or something, and to she called the police, right? The policeman took a call. She called the police and she said, "I'm hungry." Can you imagine? She said, I didn't know who else to call. I don't know what to do, but I haven't eaten in many, many days. So these two police officers, right? Seasoned police officers, alhamdulillah, kind, kindness in their heart, right? Kindness in their heart. They, <clears throat> they responded to the call with their own money. They took some groceries. They went and they saw that this 
old frail lady was all alone and she said that my hand and then they opened the refrigerator there was barely any food in there right and they cooked for her they kind of gave her food they were very very kind to her then they contacted her son who was in some other part of italy and alhamdulillah for that that he had kindness in his heart and he understood the issue and he immediately it took him a day or so to reach to his mother until that time these two police officers out of their own pocket you know this, the the money that they were uh, giving her food and they they didn't leave her alone at all till the son came and then took over and took with the alhamdulillah right those wale then who have stayed up nights for us right who have spent their best years of life in our service so to speak who have sent us to fancy mind you quote and quote expensive universities hmm? given us the best that they could and usually walidain always want uh better than what they had for their children right they want better than what they had for the children and when they come to the age of frailty when they come to the age of when they are not maybe financially that established or well off we don't spend on them yeah we don't spend on them spend on your walidain spend on your walidain and aqrabin are not just your relatives but also those who are close to your heart alhamdulillah aqrab right somebody you are close to qareeb close to your heart so that would include your friends as well right that would include your friends as well close relatives and people who are close to your heart but you can't ignore your relatives over here right spend on them while the atama yesterday also we talked about that allah subhanahu wa taala talks a lot about orphans allah subhanahu wa taala in the quran talks about the weak and the disenfranchised those people who are kind of fall through the cracks so to speak in society and people ignore them yeah generally speaking and the needy and you don't know who needy is right sometimes you don't know who needy is a it's your job to who know who needy is so that is why you need to be involved in dunya somewhere yeah and the wabna sabeel and allah says whatever khair you do for in allah bihi alim allah subhanahu wa taala is aware of it right rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has told us that sadaqa extinguishes sin as water extinguishes fire right he also said that the believers shade on the day of resurrection will be their charity right there's a there's a there's a very sweet uh, incident from the life of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam where some uh, you know when all of these verses of spend and spend and spend you know there was such a lot of focus and stress on spending in faqu you know in the way of allah subhanahu wa taala on such and such etc so some poor sahaba came to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they said that ya rasulullah we don't have anything to spend we don't have any money to spend right and a lot majority of the sahaba were actually poor right so what should we do so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught them some azkar some tasbihat some zikr right so he said you should do that so after some time they came back and they said ya rasulullah the the wealthy sahaba have also learned these tasbihat so now they spend as well as they do tasbihat subhanallah so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam smiled and he said this is the fadl of allah subhanahu wa taala he gives to whomsoever he wishes right alhamdulillah such a beautiful you know we really need to connect ourselves to the seerah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam seriously seriously if you guys have time these days right and make time uh sheikh umar suleiman is doing this beautiful series on the seerah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam take time out if you can't during ramadan even if it's a little bit right even if it's a little bit get yourself involved in getting to know the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and these incidents from the life of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it really is a great motivator it is a great motivator to know how those people were how rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was right so sadaqa this is not talking about zakat this is talking about sadaqa regular daily sadaqa is a must is a must and it doesn't have to be a lot and the the the, the spectrum of sadaqa is a lot right is very wide smiling is sadaqa hmm? removing some removing something harmful from the way is sadaqa 
so many different ways that we can make sadaqa daily <coughs> with the intention of pleasing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the verses of qital where qital has been enjoined upon the believers right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says kutiba alaykum al qital wa huwa kurhun lakum wa asa an takrahu shay'a wa huwa khairun lakum wa asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa hum nay i'm reading this in a wrong way hang on kutiba alaykum al qital wa huwa kurhun lakum wa asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khairun lakum wa asa an tuhibbu shay'an shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun uh qital is enjoined upon you while it is hard on you it could be that you dislike something when it is good for you and it could be that you like something when it is bad for you allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you do not know right so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that qital is enjoined upon you but it is not for everybody and it is not for all times that is also something which one must understand it is not like a sweeping statement it is not a sweeping hukum it is not it's a farz e kifaya if some people do it when there is a need for it then alhamdulillah that is fine yeah okay that is something to understand uh they ask you about the sacred month that is about the fighting in it say fighting in it is something grave but it is much more grave in the sight of allah subhanahu wa taala to disbelieve in him and in al masjid al haram and to expel its people from there and fitna is more ashaddu qatl right is more severe uh, and more grave than uh, killing they will go on fighting you until they turn you away from your deen if they could right while whoever of you turns away from his faith and dies an infidel such people are those who, whose deeds will be uh, will go to waste habitat amaluhum their deeds will be uh, go, uh, will be wasted right and they are the people of the fire they shall be there forever uh there are four months which were held to be sacred right battles were forbidden in these months right uh, what were those four months hang on let me tell you rajab dil qad dil hajj and muharram these are the muharram the sacred months in our day rajab dil qad dil hajj and muharram <clears throat> okay uh so battles were forbidden in these months during a journey some sahaba of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam encountered a group of enemies and fighting between them broke out the muslims were under the impression that the uh, sacred month of rajab which is like the what is it the seventh yeah it's the seventh month has not yet started so they killed a person from that group while in actual fact it was the first day of rajab so prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam expressed his grief on the incident that was quite unintentional but the enemies took this incident as an opportunity to raise a hue and cry against them and they did not honor, and said that they don't even honor the sanctity of the sacred months so this verse was revealed in that context ان الذين امنوا والذين هاجروا وجاهدوا في سبيل الله اولئك يرجون رحمه الله رحمه الله والله غفور رحيم as for those who believed and those who did hijra and carried out jihad in the way of allah subhanahu wa taala they hope for allah subhanahu wa taala's mercy and uh, allah subhanahu wa taala is غفور رحيم uh, forgiving and very merciful this is talking about doing hijra for the sake of allah subhanahu wa taala um what does that mean doing hijra in sake of allah subhanahu wa taala can mean physical hijra like rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions may there are alhamdulillah many people even today if they feel that there is some place in this world or wherever they are and it is difficult to practice their deen there they make hijra physically also alhamdulillah even now right but hijra is also a very personal thing leaving rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam once explained hijra uh, uh, um, migration for the sake of allah subhanahu wa taala when you leave something for the sake of allah subhanahu wa taala and come towards something that allah subhanahu wa taala likes that is also hijra that is also hijra right 
And according to scholars, when Iman enters your heart from a state of perhaps just dormant Iman, okay, not, not, if not Kufur, then dormant Iman, you know, like uh, Islam, like for the, from the state of Islam, because Islam is a legal status, right? And Iman is something which is a living thing. Iman is something that fluctuates. Iman is something that goes up and down. Iman is something else. Iman and Islam are not exactly the same thing. We will inshallah discuss it another time. So when that Iman enters, then it is the necessary ingredient of Iman is Hijra and Jihad. Right? Necessary, right? The first is that you do it with yourself. Right? The struggle for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for your own sake, getting out of your comfort zone is this hijra, right? Implementing the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on yourself is your personal jihad, is your personal jihad. So for us women, when we put that hijab or that dupatta or that chadar on our head, that is serious jihad for some of us, right? Maybe not for everybody. People are very pure and very... Uh, Alhamdulillah have got their hearts so inclined towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that's not such a big deal at all, right? But for some of us who are weak in our iman, who are passive in our iman, that might be a great deal. Yeah, but doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alhamdulillah. So it is the literally with iman, uh, hijra and jihad go hand in hand. Moving away, there are certain things when you when that iman is kind of lighting up inside of your heart and inshallah hopefully increasing, then there are certain things when you bind yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments, there are certain things which perhaps you used to do before, but now you just can't. You know, you just really can't. It, you have to stay within that parameter. Hmm? Have you guys seen that movie uh, of Tom Hanks? Uh, uh, what is what was it called? Castaway, Castaway, where he was stuck on a desert island for God knows how many years, right? So he he, he to keep himself sane because he was I think uh, working for some courier company or something, right? So uh, to keep himself sane, he had this football and he carves the face or something into it and calls it Wilson, and he he used to talk to him so that he doesn't go completely mad of or because of solitude. So after years and years or whatever, he makes a raft or something, and then he uh, kind of uh, is successful in getting away from that desert island, right? After many, many years. So this Wilson, he sort of ties to the raft. And because he's out at sea, quite literally, he, he used to fish. He had this rope tied to the raft, and he would, you know, uh, uh, plunge into the sea to catch fish, etc. But he would keep holding on to the rope. Otherwise, he would be lost at sea completely. He would let go if he let go of the raft. You know? So once Wilson just kind of went adrift. He didn't realize it. He was sleeping or something. I don't know. So And he, he just was so upset because that was his focal point of keeping himself sane. He was screaming, Wilson, Wilson, whatever. And he tried to swim towards him. right? But then he came to the end of the rope. He's holding the rope, which is stuck to the raft. And Wilson is floating away. Why am I giving this example? Because when Iman is in your heart, no matter how tempting something looks, but it is beyond the parameter of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rope, so to speak. What is the choice that a believer has? Do I save myself by hanging on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or do I let it go and swim towards my desires? That is jihad. That is hijra. Right? So that is something which those who have people, who have iman do and for them there is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy right because they hope for that mercy and for them allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor ur rahim may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from among them ayah number 219 yes aluna khamri wal maisir they ask you o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about gambling about wine and gambling khamr and maisir now, this, this ayah over here is a preparation of make, making khamar haram, right? In, in, uh, uh, in Surah Nisa, uh, it's going to be repeated and then it's going to be finalized in Surah al maida So we're going to talk about that in great detail, inshallah, when we get to that. Right now, we'll just go over that in briefly. 
Say, O Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in both there is great sin and some benefits for people. Allahu Akbar. Now look at Allah subhanahu wa taala's uh, uh, adl that He is saying that perhaps there is some benefit, right? Right? Perhaps there is some benefit. Like some people say, na, that the oxidizing effect of red wine or something. Yeah, people talk about that and about uh, legalizing marijuana. Is it marijuana or weed? What something? Because it has medicinal effect, etc. Allah subhanahu wa taala is saying, in both there is a great sin and some benefits for people, but their sin is greater than their benefit. Very clearly. What is muhuma akbar min nafaihuma? Let's have that very very clear. Their sin is greater than their benefit. And they ask you, O Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Maza yunusikun, the same thing, right? Remember, we just did that. Uh, what they should spend? Say, ul al af. Allah, this is so beautiful. Al af, yani it means over here the surplus, the surplus. Spend the surplus. Hmm? This is how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes His verses clear to you, so that you may ponder. Now. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has not given a specific amount. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has said, "You decide. Whatever is extra for you, and what is extra for me may not be extra for you. Everybody's extra is different, na? right? If I feel within halal means, I feel that I need to have twenty outfits, right? And the number twenty-one is extra. Then that is my extra. If you feel that ten outfits are fine." Number eleven is extra. Then that is your extra. It is such an individual thing that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has not put us in any uh, difficulty by giving us a formula totally. That two point five percent of the wealth. Imagine, it's puny uh, considered uh, considering that all of the wealth that we have is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Himself, right? Right, and it's a percentage, so it depends on how much a person has. Don't shy away from spending. Don't shy away from spending, and spend that which is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has also said, uh, given us a middle ground about that. There's no need to spend like too much that you become fakir yourself, right, uh, and that you become a, a, a beggar or 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 uh, somebody who would need to ask. And your needs are not fulfilled, right? But Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is saying, whatever extra you give, hmm, that is up to you. That is up to you. And this is how Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala ponders, makes you ponder over the verses. Uh, this is how Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala makes His verses clear to you, so that you may ponder on this world and the hereafter. They ask you, O Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, about the orphans. See, orphans are coming again. Say, to work for their good is good, right? And if you live with them jointly, they are after all your brethren. And Allah subhanahu wa taala knows the one who makes mischief as distinct from the one who promotes good. And if Allah subhanahu wa taala had wished, He would have put you in trouble. Surely, Allah subhanahu wa taala is mighty and wise. So again, looking after orphans physically as well, right? Physically as well, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is saying that they are like your brothers, right? So if somebody is taking care of an orphan, yeah, in some family, for example, uh, somebody passes away and there are young orphan children and other family members are living together and taking care of them, that it is for their responsibility not only to look after their needs but also to do the islah, right? Also. To uh, 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 do their tarbiyah and their training and their education, and how do you are you supposed to do it? With khair, right? With love, right? Making them feel good about it, right? not making them feel that I am doing you this great favor. Your parents are dead or your father is dead. No, as it is, an orphan is a very sensitive person, right? There is a lot of sensitivity in the heart of a person who doesn't have either both parents or one parent. what they require of course they require the fulfillment of their needs but they also require fulfillment of their emotional needs then allah says in ayah 221 do not marry the polytheist women uh, mushrik women 
unless they, they come to believe a muslim slave girl is better than a mushrik woman even though she may attract you and do not give your women in marriage to mushrik men unless they come to believe a muslim slave is better than a mushrik uh, even though he may attract you they invite to the fire when allah subhanahu wa taala invites to uh, they invite to the fire when allah subhanahu wa taala invites by his will to paradise and to forgiveness he makes his verses clear to the people so that they may heed the advice so for the believing man right a mushrik woman you cannot have marriage with a mushrik woman but you can marry a woman of the book right jews and christians but for a muslim woman you can only marry have nikah with a muslim man a believing man now over here people argue and you know go blue in the face saying oh what believing man what believing woman non practicing practicing non practicing that is besides the point in terms of the sharia what allah subhanahu wa taala is clearly saying is you cannot have a nikah with a mushrik right for men you can have a nikah with a uh, with a woman of the book jews and christians for women you cannot have a nikah with a jew and christian either whether you are practicing or not practicing whether he is practicing or practicing or not practicing in matters of law this is how it is and may allah subhanahu wa taala make us all practicing muslims because at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam i think the sahaba would have been stunned even just to hear the word what does that mean non practicing muslim they, they wouldn't probably get it right no. then allah subhanahu wa taala says they ask you about menstruation all of this is in the quran all of this is in the quran alhamdulillah right say o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is an impurity so keep away from women during menstruation and do not have intimacy with them until they are cleansed but when they are cleansed then go to them from where allah subhanahu wa taala has commanded you surely allah subhanahu wa taala loves those who are most repenting and loves those who keep themselves pure right inna allah yuhibbu at-tawwabina wa yuhibbu al-mutatahhirin okay now how do you understand this verse allah subhanahu wa taala is talking about this menstrual cycle that he has kept in the bodies of our, uh, of women for a specific reason we will not discuss exactly what a menstrual cycle is to cleanse your uterus etc all of that once a month we have that time of the year uh, that time of the month right when uh, your wife is having a period men are told not to have intercourse with them okay that is what it means and when allah subhanahu wa taala is saying mm, keep away from women during menstruation it means it in that sense or the sense of intimacy right there was this uh, um <coughs> there was this belief right that uh, a lot of uh, uh, some some uh, um, traditions that a woman is impure <coughs> when she is in her period right so uh, for example in the hindu religion they 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 can't go inside their kitchen or uh, uh, a lot of times there were extremes that they would be delegated to stay outside of the house and in other traditions as well whereas we know that aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala and says that i would be in my period right i would be in my uh, cycle and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would lean against me and he would be reading the quran and she says that i would be in my period cycle and i would eat a uh, 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 a piece of meat and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would eat it from the same place right so a woman doesn't become impure she's in a state of impurity but she herself is not impure right that is important to understand allah subhanahu wa taala has not delegated us nauz billah any kind of a uh, position where we become impure no and there is a scientific and a very rational and a very logical reason for women to have menses okay okay then allah subhanahu wa taala says your women meaning your wives are tillage for you to cultivate so come to your tillage from where you wish yani fields and advance something for yourself and fear allah subhanahu wa taala and know that you are to meet him and give good news to the believers right nisaukum harsulakum now this is a verse where sometimes girls and women get very angry what do you mean that i am a uh, i am a field i am a tillage for a man that's not what allah subhanahu wa taala is saying 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using such a productive, such a beautiful and such a, a, such a honorable parable for us, for you and me. Hmm? Allah is not comparing me to uh, something fluff. Hmm? Something fluff. Uh, I don't know. Allah is not calling me baby, most certainly, because I'm not. I'm a mature person, right? Allah is not calling me a princess, right? Allah is not calling me, a, I don't know, the moon or a butterfly, something flitty, something flitty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not calling me heart, right? All of us who post our uh, selfies with the duck face and then they have uh, 10 likes saying, oh, wow, you're looking hot. And we get so happy that I'm looking hot. Allah is calling me something so productive, something so useful, something which is of benefit to me and something which is of benefit to others. This is an honor, an honorable parable, right? I'm not a Disney princess. I'm not, right? I'm not hypersexualized. You must watch. I'll, I'll share it with you, inshallah. Uh, Rohefa, please remind me that I look for that. Just a few days ago, I saw this again. Somebody had shared it. There are some very useful things that are on social media as well. Somebody had shared about this man, a father, not a believing man, not a Muslim man, a father who was very upset about how girls, he had a little daughter, how girls are, uh, how, how difficult it is to buy clothes for girls, number one, and how girls are viewed even from a very young age, as sexual little creatures. Hmm? Daddy's princess. Why? Why do we feel that honor in that and we don't see the honor of being a field? Right? I'm not sitting there waiting to be saved by the knight in shining armor. I myself am a productive human being. If you approach me with taqwa, if you approach me with good, Inshallah, inshallah, I'm going to benefit you so much that you're going to be amazed, right? This is for Janu. Hmm? I'm not just some floozy. I'm not just, I don't know, 36, 24, 36. I'm not just some measurement. And this father was complaining and he was saying that it is ridiculous that when you go buy clothes for little girls, for little girls, they are going to be much tighter and they're going to be much more revealing. He said that I can't find a one-piece decent swimsuit for my, I don't know, two-year-old or three-year-old. That is the reality that is happening. And we are perfectly okay with that. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Nisa ukum harsul lakum, right? Do we have a problem with that? Think, think, guys. Will my Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have a gender bias? Does my Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have a gender bias? No, right? Understand your position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Understand the honor that has inherently been given to you. So what scholars say is that particular reference to context, because Allah was talking about uh, uh, high uh, menstruation. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is that don't have intercourse with them at that time, and also in our deen, certain positions of intercourse are simply not allowed. Right? Okay. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not make the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the subject of your oaths against your doing good, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and setting, setting things right between people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all hearing and all uh, knowing. Right? And God. Oh, wait a <clears throat> Allah does not hold you accountable for what is in love, what is um, unnecessary, what is uh, not love can be described also as um, an oath uh, ineffectual, really, right? So over here, Allah is saying that do not swear oaths 
to refrain yourselves from doing virtuous acts. And this was in 224. Don't just say <coughs> Allah ki qasam, etc. all the time. Yeah, that's not good. Right. And also, don't take love uh, promises. Right. Don't hold on to oaths and promises that are that you kind of just made by the way. Don't do that. Um, Allah subhanahu and if you have done that, for example, if it is something that you just said, by the way, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is forgiving. No. Allah does not hold you accountable for what is love in your oaths, but he holds you accountable for what your hearts have produced. So if you have actually meant it, only then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold uh, you accountable. But what scholars say is that it's not a good idea to make, make like any promises, you know. Or just left, right, and center say, I promise and I swear, or Allah ki khasam. That's not a good idea at all. Those who swear to abstain from their wives have four months of waiting. Now, from over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to start talking about divorce. And these are very serious and very exhaustive commandments, and they are a very serious part of the Sharia. So, we are going to go over the verses with very little commentary. Those who swear to abstain from their wives have four months of waiting. Therefore, if they revert back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving and very merciful. Uh, this is the number 226. So if a husband swears an oath, then he, he will not have any intimate relations with his wife for four months or more, or for an indefinite period, it is termed in Islamic fiqh as illa. Right? This verse lays down the rule that... Um, in this situation, the husband has two options, right? Either you break his oath by having intercourse with his wife before four months are over and offer a kafara, an expiation of breaking the oath, in which case the marriage will continue. Or to abide by his uh, oath, in which case the wife will be deemed to have been divorced on the completion of four months. This is to prevent the unjust custom whereby the husbands, by swearing such an oath, violated the rights of women, they neither gave her the due right of being a wife, nor did they divorce her to let her marry someone else. So Allah is saying if they revert back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving. It means that if they break their oath by uh, giving her her marital rights, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the sin of oath breaking. Okay. And if they resolve to divorce, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all hearing and all knowing. Divorced women shall keep themselves waiting for three periods and it is not permissible for them to conceal what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in their wombs if they believe in Allah and the last day, right? So this is the uh, idda of divorce. Their husbands are best entitled to take them back in the meantime if they want a settlement. Women have rights similar to what they owe in recognized manner, though for... Uh, though recognize them and oh okay there it comes for men there is a step above them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is almighty and all wise now this portion of the verse this is also something which is most misunderstood and is considered to be very very misogynistic right imagine if you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is misogynistic, then where are we going to go? Right? Okay. First of all, understand something. These are all the rulings of divorce and marriage. Okay? First of all, understand something. When Allah is saying that for men, there is a step above them. He's not talking about all men and all women. Allah is talking about a husband and a wife. Have that clear. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he has given a daraja over a wife to a husband, right? This has to do with the Islamic concept of being an amir, of being a head of something. Yeah, we have this concept in all human collective group situations. That is the Islamic etiquette that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Whether it is a group of women or a group of men or a group which is called a household, which is made up of men and women, Islamic philosophy of managing human relations is that in all cases, there will be an Amir, 
at the end of the day there will be a manager and ultimate decision maker and that is the daraja that allah subhanahu wa taala is talking about right and if you look at all the ahadith about the sensitive and huge responsibility of an amir right that type of amir allah subhanahu wa taala has made a husband any of you who are a ceo of a company hmm, or are in a leadership position anywhere do you understand the severity of your responsibility right it is your neck darling yeah so basically what allah subhanahu wa taala is saying if we say it in that manner it, it's your neck janu it's your neck right and most certainly it doesn't mean that that daraja should be taken advantage of unfortunately what has happened is that regardless of faith regardless of faith in all traditions men have abused women men have uh, oppressed women to such an extent right unfortunately predominantly there are always exceptions alhamdulillah there are many exceptions i'm not saying all men have oppressed all women that's not true either some men have oppressed some women so much that believing women have also become affronted from allah subhanahu wa taala because some believing men allegedly believing men have taken deen as a resort sunna of rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as an uh, as kind of a thing saying that oh it is a sunna to do this allah subhanahu wa taala has given me a delegated position higher than the woman now so billah they are going to be answerable to allah subhanahu wa taala they are going to be answerable to allah subhanahu wa taala right this is not talking about all men and all women okay men should study how to be a household how to be in a household how to be a husband and head of a household from the example of rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam really because that is our example our example is not some twisted uh, uh, interpretation of certain verses of the quran it's not that and it is a huge huge responsibility and a huge problematic sin on a person who twists the words of allah subhanahu wa taala for his own advantage hmm? so please rest assured that this is not for all men and women this is in a relationship of a marriage it is talking about a household right and in that context the head of the household is the husband and there is nothing to be concerned about right households where there are no husbands then the women are the head of the household for example if you are a single mom or your husband has passed away and you're not married then you're on your own aren't you okay so don't get so thing about it then allah subhanahu wa taala says uh at talaq maratan divorce is twice then either to retain in all fairness or to release uh the ma'ruf right nicely it is not lawful for you to take back anything from what you have given them unless both apprehend that they will not be able to maintain the limit set by allah subhanahu wa taala now if you apprehend that they would not maintain the limit set by allah subhanahu wa taala then there is no sin on them in what she gives up to secure her release these are the limits set by allah subhanahu wa taala therefore do not exceed the limit set by allah subhanahu wa taala uh, then those are the transgressors whoever exceeds the limit set by allah subhanahu wa taala then those are the transgressors now in 229 what allah subhanahu wa taala is saying is that there was a uh maratan is plural uh, that means two it comes for a number the divorce should not be given at one time we have learned how to give divorce and etc from movies yeah talaq 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 tish 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 three thappar then kicked out of the house no that's not what our deen is all about please let's have that very clear right once when the woman the when the man gives talaq right and the woman enters her period of idda <coughs> there is this possibility of getting back together okay if it happens the second time and once a talaq is declared which is a verbal thing just like nikah is a verbal contract that is for life so it should be completely and clearly understood 
by guys, right? That if there is no excuse for saying that I divorce you, right? In a in a fit of anger or whatever, because that holds, right? It holds. So you need to be very careful about that. We are just skimming over a few things over here. These are not fatwas and great explanation of the fiqh of divorce or of the rulings on divorce. I will keep repeating that just in case. Don't think that by reading these verses, you and I have become any expert on what, how divorce should be like or we start giving advice to people about divorce. Please have that very clear. Write it down if you want. Okay. So what were they saying? Yeah. So when during that idda, you can get back together. But when that happens twice, then there is the waiting period in which you need to get your nikah done again. Okay, that is what it means. And with all of these ayahs of divorce, you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, hududullah, tilka hududullah, fala ta'taduha, right? And do not exceed the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If any of us in our families goes through a situation of marital discord, and it comes to divorce, please seek guidance from scholars about how to go about it amicably in a ma'roof manner, right? These are very emotional and sensitive times. Uh, emotions are flaring everywhere, you know. A lot of stuff is going on, right? Upheaval is happening. Most unpleasant time, right? Do not exceed the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, if he divorces her, she shall no, 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 she shall no longer remain lawful for him unless she marries a man other than him. Should he too divorce her, then there is no sin on, on them in their returning to each other. If they think they would maintain the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes clear to a people who know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alone capable of setting these limits. So a couple divorces. Hmm? Now for them to get back together and the divorce is finalized, the woman should get married to somebody else, right? Not as a halala, not as a set up position that, oh, okay, so let's do this so that, you know, not finding a loophole. Naturally, in the course of time, in a course of things, so she meets somebody, she gets married. So he either dies or he divorces her again in a natural sequence of things. Then only can they get back together then only can they get, get back to the, together because divorce is a very serious matter. You can't just play with women. You can't just play with relationships that, you know, today I'm on and tomorrow I'm off. No. Tilka hududullah. These are the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have divorced women and they have approached the end of their idda, their waiting period, then either retain them with fairness or uh, release them with fairness. Do not retain them with wrongful intent, resulting in cruelty on your part. And whoever does this actually wrongs himself. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing men that if the idda period is over, right? And don't keep uh, yo-yoing around like this, right? Just to uh, uh, torture her, just to uh, 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 bother her, just to make her life miserable. Let her go, right? And she should also go, right? Let her go, right? Do not take the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in jest. وَلَا تَتَّخِذُوا آيَاتِ اللَّهِ huzuwa. Right, according to scholars, this is the only place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the believers and saying, Wala ayatillahi huzuwa. A lot of times we are very particular about our namaz and our uh, uh, and about our sol uh, and our about our rozas and about our uh, you know the pillars of deen about ibadah. But when it comes to ma'amalat, we think that Allah has got nothing to do with it. This is a very serious ma'amala of relationships which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prescribing how to go about it. Yeah. Um, and remember the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on you and what he has revealed to you of the book and the wisdom, giving you good counsel thereby and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In all of these matters of marriage and divorce and that of remarriage, if there is no taqwa in the heart of the man and in the heart of the woman, we are going to mess it up. We are going to cross the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do as we please. We need to be very careful about it. Ittaqullah and be sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one who knows everything. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you have divorced women and they have and they have reached the end of their waiting period, do not prevent them from marrying their husbands when they mutually agree with fairness. So the first divorce has, the second divorce has happened and they both want to get back together. 
the ones who have divorced right now after the second divorce there is a possibility of nikah right they can get back together and then the family members say no 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 ye kaise ho sakta hai hamari izzat ka sawal hai right you let her go once so we are not going to let you marry her again or something like that to that extent allah subhanahu wa taala is saying no if there is mutual agreement he wants to get back she wants to get back right let it be don't get it don't uh, become like a uh, zalim samaj situation that's the advice is giving to you and what it happens is that uh, this is 232 right what uh, what it happened is that there was a sahabi who's uh, this incident happened with his uh, sister right um he uh, her husband divorced her once after the idda he wanted to marry her again but the sahabi said no you do not honor her but she said i want to go back so allah subhanahu wa taala is saying don't stop them when two people want to get married and there is no issue of deen then they should not be stopped right that is what allah subhanahu wa taala is saying this is more pure and clean for you allah subhanahu wa taala knows and you do not know uh mothers Uh, should suckle their children for two full years for one who wants to complete the period of suckling it is the obligation of the one whom the child belongs to that he provides food and clothing for them with fairness right uh with fairness okay nobody is obligated beyond his capacity right la yukallifun la yukallifun nafsun illa wus'aha nobody is obligated neither the woman nor the man beyond their capacity no mother shall be made to suffer or on account of her child nor the man to whom the child belongs on account of his child a lot of times when there are children and there is a divorce situation there's a huge tussle and uh, literally uh, mothers are held ransom or fathers are held ransom because of the children don't do that right please don't do that that is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying likewise the responsibility of suckling lies on the one who may become an heir of the child now if they want to wean with mutual consent and consultation there is no sin on them and if you want to get your children suckled by a wet nurse there is no sin on you when you pay off what are uh, to uh, when you pay off what you are to give with fairness and fear allah subhanahu wa taala and be assured that allah subhanahu wa taala is watchful of what you do so you you must have noticed that in these verses that these are very legal verses right these are legal rulings of the quran related to divorce but allah subhanahu wa taala keeps the moral aspect together with the legal aspect so over here allah subhanahu wa taala is saying that the islamic concept of alimony is still the mother is breastfeeding ayah 234 those among you who pass away and leave leave wives behind their wives keep themselves waiting for 4 months and 10 days now this is for a widow the idda period for a per, uh, for a woman whose husband has passed away is 4 months and 10 days okay so when they have reached the end of their waiting period there is no sin on you in what they do for themselves in a recognized manner allah subhanahu wa taala is all aware of what you do right there is no sin on you if you hint as a proposal to the women or conceal it in their hearts allah knows that you will not you will make mention of them but do not make a promise to them secretly except that you speak in a recognized manner nor resolve upon a contract of marriage until the prescribed time until her iddat period is finished be assured that allah subhanahu wa taala knows what is in your hearts so fear allah subhanahu wa taala and be assured that allah is most forgiving and forbearing So what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is saying is that there is absolutely for a widow, right? If somebody wants to marry her, Alhamdulillah, no problem at all. And it is a very cultural thing in our society that we feel that oh my God, oh my God, like a widow should never get married, right? That a widow should never get married. Hmm? There is no problem. In fact, when we see uh, the lives of uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his Sahaba, there were many many people. Who were married, then they got divorced, and got married to somebody else, or somebody's husband died, then they got got married again. So it's not such an issue at all. We have made a uh, remarriage of whether it's a man or a woman so scandalous, as if now so billah that the woman is about to have an affair or something, right? We we generally say about a widow who gets married, right? And particularly say if she gets married right after her idda period, what do we say about her? Shadi rajali. in a very uh, sarcastic and venomous way 
right? Doesn't care about her children, right? The what the the matti on the 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 the, the sand, uh, what is it? The uh, the soil on the grave is still wet, and now she's thinking about marriage. Oh my goodness, Allah, whoever, where have we got all this from? This has got nothing to do with our deen. This has got nothing to do with our deen, right? Okay. But if somebody wants to get married, right, even during the Adda period, contain yourself, right? You can send a proposal, but nothing secretive. There's nothing secretive in relationships in our deen. You must have noticed everything is above board. Everything is bil ma'roof, the way it is done in society. Everything is announced, right? A lot of times we have such an issue with, with say, for example, a uh, a man wants to get married again or something. People tell the wife, yeah? People tell the wife what? No, 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 let him be. Let him be. It's just a passing phase. He'll come back to you. Allah, who Akbar, we accept zina, but we don't accept nikah. We accept zina wholeheartedly, but we don't accept nikah, right? So a woman, her husband has died. Even if she's a mother of God knows how many children, her mother or uh, children are older or whatever, doesn't she have a right to have a partner if she wants to? If she doesn't want to, fine, alhamdulillah, no problem. But if she wants to, what's the problem? Why do we make it an issue? Right? Okay. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, I must say one thing. The younger generation is much more aligned with the Quran in this matter than our older generation. They are much more open about the fact that people who lose their husbands or lose their wives or are divorced, if they find another partner, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And sometimes children help their own parents you know, in setting up a nikah or a marriage together and are very happy about it. Alhamdulillah, that's wonderful. That is progressive thinking. That is truly progressive thinking. Alhamdulillah. There is no liability uh, of uh, uh, dower on you if you divorce women when you have not yet touched them nor fixed for them an amount. So give them a, a gift, a rich man according to his means and a poor one according to his means, a benefit in the recognized manner and obligation on the Virtuous, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying over here that nikah is done, meher is fixed. Rukhsati didn't happen, so the marriage is not consummated and talaq happens. So give half of the meher. Give half of the meher. Meher is, by the way, extremely important at the time of nikah. Extremely important at the time of nikah. And somehow we uh, relate or we kind of associate uh, meher with talaq. No. Meher has got nothing to do with Allah, right? Meher is at the time of nikah, right? Okay. And there is no set meher as well, actually. So it's according to your means, whatever you can afford. So if you are, if a young girl is getting married to a young man, say in their 20s, so he's not going to have the same income as his dad, who's probably much older. So the meher is going to be according to the position of the groom, right? Not the groom's father. Okay. If you divorce them before you have touched them, while you have already fixed for them an amount of dower, then there is one half of what you have fixed unless they forgive or forgive the one in whose hand lies the marriage tie. And it is closer to taqwa that you forgive and you do not forget. So if in a situation where the marriage has not been consummated and you are returning, you are giving the, uh, the amount that was fixed and it wasn't given before, then you, you, you're not liable to give the full amount. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you do, then it is better for you. Or if the woman just says, that, no, I don't want it. Alhamdulillah, no issue. But for a man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it is closer to taqwa that you give all of it. Right? Um, to be great. Uh, uh, and it's closer to taqwa that you forgive and do not forget to be graceful to one another. Even in a situation as uh, painful and as uh, problematic and troublesome and full of anxiety as a break, breaking up of marriage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, do not forget to have taqwa, forgive and be graceful to one another. Even if you don't have children. It's not just related to children, but if you do have children, most certainly be graceful to each other. Right? Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watchful over what you do. Take care of all, do care of all the prayers in the middle prayer and stand in devotion before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in between all of these family matters, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a very serious and a painful matter of breaking up of marriage. In between that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, take care of your prayer. Even though you are caught up in an interpersonal matter, don't forget your salat. And particularly, salat al-wusta, 
uh, scholars say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the Asr prayer over here, right? The Asr prayer. Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just told us that if you deliberately miss your Asr prayer, specifically he said this about Asr prayer, if you deliberately miss your Asr prayer, it is as if you have destroyed everything in this dunya that you had. Everything is in this dunya that you had. But if you are in fear, then pray on foot or riding. But when you are in peace, recite Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name as he has taught you what you did not know. So even in a state of, say, extreme fear, whether it is uh, because of armed conflict or for whatever reason that you are uh, in a state of war or maybe refugees fleeing somewhere, any state of fear, do not lose your prayer. Pray whichever way you can. If you can't pray properly, like standing on a, on a masala and all, even if you're on a ride, even if you're riding somewhere, even if you are on a vehicle, pray, right? Recite Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name as he has taught you what you did not know. Those among you who pass away and leave wives behind are commanded to make a will in favor of their wives to be maintained for one year without being expelled. Then if they move out, there is no sin on you in what they, uh, what they have done for themselves according to the fair practice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mighty and wise. So this verse over here is now actually abrogated because first it was that initially uh, that there was a no uh, there a share for the wife uh, in her husband's inheritance was not determined by that time, nor the period of idda of a widow was fixed. So the husband in those days was ordered to make this will in her favor so that she might receive her maintenance from the property of her husband and might reside in his own for home for one full year. So then afterwards, inshallah, we will see that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designated uh, the inheritor's share, then this was not followed anymore. The divorced women deserve a benefit according to the fair practice being an obligation on the God fearing. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes his verses clear to you so that you may understand, right? These verses are not to be taken lightly. These verses are not to be taken in jest, right? These verses are very serious commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they should be taken as such. Okay. Uh, now another topic is starting. So inshallah, uh, we will stop here because it is 4.32 now and continue with the topic later on. If any of you have questions, 